Hello, and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. Welcome to 2022. Happy New Year. <laughs> welcome to the new year. Something that I would like to do this year is uh, branch out a little bit and look at the lives and work of generally eccentric people uh, who may not be the most well-known sort of mini biographies, not only encompassing, but instead focusing on periods or aspects of these people's experiences. Uh, these are not going to be completely random. <laughs> they will be in line with the channel's interests. We are going to be starting today by covering the life of folk, mystic, animator Harry Everett Smith. Now, there's a lot here. <laughs> Smith was many things. He had an avid interest in the occult. He was a Gnostic bishop. He is associated with the Beat Generation and maintained a close friendship with Allen Ginsberg, who bankrolled him later in his life. He was also a hoarder and a record collector, which is the first part of his life I really want to dig into here because, and I don't think it's a stretch to say, Smith helped preserve and maintain a part of the American identity with his collecting. The America he preserved was the America he was born into, the 1920s, Portland, Oregon. He was raised by a teacher and a fisherman. Both of his parents were fans of folk music, so he was exposed to it and gained an appreciation for it at a young age. Smith had a medical exemption from the Second World War, so he served instead as an airplane mechanic. He invested the money he made from this into records, blues, folk, and jazz. After the war, he moved to California, the Bay Area, where he would apparently hit up junk shops and store sales, going out of business, or just unloading their older stock, looking for rare folk records. Hillbilly music, uh, race records, as they were known at the time. These were long out of print and largely forgotten 78s. For those unfamiliar, a 78 is an early phonograph record that was extremely limited in its space. You could really just fit one song on each side. They were made of schlack and were prone to hisses and other audio imperfections. 78 uh, RPM was the dominant recording format until the late 1940s when the LP was introduced, long play. Think of this as the jump from VHS to DVD. The sound was clearer and the format could hold a lot more information, in this case, songs. Harry Smith amassed quite a rare 78 collection. We will get to his films in a bit, but around the same time LPs were picking up steam, Smith received a Guggenheim grant to produce a film. He used this money to travel to New York City, where he would eventually settle. He had his record collection sent to him, and when his grant money ran out, Smith approached Moses Ash, president of Folkways Records, intending to sell or license his collection, uh, preserve it, and convert it from 78 to LP. Ash countered with the idea of Smith curating a compilation from his collection. This idea became the three-volume, six-LP anthology of American folk music. When putting these sets together, Smith decided to highlight the period between 1927, when recording technology could reproduce music more accurately than it had in the past, and 1932, when sales and interest in these types of music dried up on account of the Great Depression, <laughs> widespread poverty among the performing and consumer base. The anthology of American folk music was broken into three different volumes, each with two LPs. These were organized by style, uh, or I guess intent, ballads, social music, and songs. Within each volume, the individual songs were sequenced in a way that followed or provided uh, some sort of historical context uh, or overarching narrative. Uh, this curation is amazing. <laughs> the amount of work and love that went into it, uh, I can't even imagine, uh, given that this is sourced from thousands of phonographs, uh, the knowledge and dedication required to pull this off. Again, nothing short of amazing. The liner notes are also worth mentioning. Uh, we've been flipping through them here. So incredible design, uh, just flipping through. You can see uh, how it's presented uh, with lyrics and info on the artists or songs, uh, some illustrations. This is more than context. Uh, it's explaining or teaching an appreciation, uh, why you should like this, why this is important. The cover design is also an interesting choice. It features an etching by engraver Theodore de Bry, uh, the celestial monochord. <laughs> That's what Smith called this, a name taken from an instrument uh, slash scientific device devised by astrologer Robert Flood. That's the extent that I understand it at least. <laughs> Feel free to elaborate in the comments uh, if you know more. All three volumes had the same image with a different color overlaid, red, green, and blue, as Smith saw it fire, air, and water. Given his interests in the occult and astronomy, and the fact that Smith incorporated these different philosophies into this project, <laughs> created a very unique product. From an anthropological standpoint, this is a culture that was largely forgotten, or just unknown. Stories and songs by people, uh, some of which who had passed in America, 
that also had passed <laughs> in America they no longer existed. Uh, now there is the issue though of uh, copyright ownership. Smith collected this material and took on the monumental task of curating it, but he didn't own any of the rights. They were not his to give. The uh, record companies, you know, I don't really care so much. <laughs> they got paid eventually, the 1997 reissue, but the artists who created and conveyed this history never saw a dime from this. Not that it sold the best, it initially sold something like 50 copies, but it would find a very dedicated fan base in the folk revival scene in New York's Greenwich Village in the late 50s. There were other folk music archives, government archives, the Library of Congress, but this was a commercial release and was produced in such an interesting and loving way that it reached an audience some of collections just didn't. This is not to discount the work of other archivists like John and Alan Lomax, but without the anthology of American folk music, folk music possibly stays niche, <laughs> there is likely no folk revival, no Bob Dylan, and popular music would look very different today. Harry Everett Smith was also a filmmaker and animator. This is the other aspect of his life I'd like to look at in further detail. Surprising no one, his films were experimental, playing with space and form, very abstract, very similar to Absolute Film, which we've looked at before. Uh, now only a handful of his films are accessible, so we are going to be uh, working with what we got here. Uh, also, the way that these have been preserved is going to make it a little difficult to cover, uh, given that I found this as part of a collection known simply as Early Abstractions. It features seven films, each numbered like a composition, one uh, through five, seven and ten. Uh, the others are lost, but the way that these are collected, it's not always clear when one ends and the other begins, uh, though I have tried my best to get everything correct. These films were produced between 1939 and 1957, and we do see some uh, stylistic progression from straight abstract drawn directly onto film to more symbolic cutout stop motion uh, or collage films. They were mostly intended to be synced uh, with jazz music, which complements the frenetic energy quite well. My favorite of the bunch is number two, Message from the Sun. This was made using stickers, circular stickers, as well as Vaseline in color directly applied onto the film, uh, showing different phases of the sun. I mentioned Absolute Film earlier, and in number five, Smith pays tribute to one of that movement's central figures, Oscar Fischinger. Uh, it greatly resembles Fischinger's An Optical Poem, uh, the way it uses the uh, circles, again a circular pattern. In numbers 10 and 11, uh, which was not part of this collection, uh, but I found it separately, uh, these are so similar, <laughs> they actually have the uh, same subtitle, Mere Animations. In these, Smith moves away from purely abstract to using cutouts. This was the technique he would use in what is probably his best known composition, number 12, Heaven and Earth Magic. This follows a character as she navigates bizarre and surreal situations. There are scenes here that are comical, <laughs> others that are absolutely nightmarish. Like with his work on the anthology of American folk music, he takes these products, in this case images or aesthetics of another time, and recontextualizes them, passing them through his own lens of understanding. In doing so, it feels untethered from one specific time. Uh, it is very 60s. <laughs> this predates Monty Python, um, but it definitely resembles Terry Gilliam's later animations. Uh, a lot of the aesthetics used are from the Victorian era. Uh, there's a lot of innovative machines uh, imagined using the tech available from that time, uh, similar to steampunk. Uh, while it doesn't always hit, in my opinion, when it does, Heaven and Earth Magic lives up to its name. It uh, very much feels like the creator, Smith, is conjuring this, <laughs> manipulating the past, objects, references, uh, to create a really interesting effect. Final thoughts on Harry Everett Smith. He absolutely lived a bohemian life, which may sound romantic to some, but from what I gathered, he could be a handful with his illicit drug use and rampant alcoholism. He died in 1991 after falling ill in his apartment in New York's Chelsea Hotel, which was long a hub for creative people, authors, artists, in a world that feels like it doesn't exist anymore. And I think that's fitting for Harry Smith. What we've looked at here is but the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Harry Everett Smith. I will post links in the description if you want to check him out for yourself. Let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and if you have the means, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We have a bunch of different content over there, including animating the board, looking at the animated history of the NFB, the National Film Board of Canada, 
five dollars a month gets you access to that and dozens of other videos and series and helps keep these videos coming out regularly that's patreon.com slash pics and portraits as always thank you all so much for interest in this channel and thanks for watching see you next time